Welcome yeah. everybody. We are going to go ahead and get started here. We are, um, you are here to learn how to get a manager and learn all the uh, no holds barred ins and outs of what a manager does, how you get one, the right way to approach them, the wrong way, all of the nitty gritty. We're going to try to get to it as much as we can in the next hour or so with our guest, Matt. Um, but first of all, we're going to go around and um, introduce everybody from ISA, which is what we do all the time. And yeah. I'll start. I'm Shana. I'm the manager of production and research. Um, and I have been hosting some of these alongside Matt today, co-hosting with Jaren. I'm Molly. I'm the director of operations. Um, I do uh, oversee events and staff and marketing and promotions and a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and Matt, thank you for being here. It's great to meet you. And um, we're really excited to talk to you. And I know we get to talk to you again in a couple of weeks. Um, we have a pitch panel coming up on the 21st. Everybody, if you want to check out our events page, you'll find the information there um, where we're going to be able to uh, see a few people pitch to an industry panel, which is going to include Matt, as well as Quinn Haberman, who's the development executive at uh, Selfish Mermaid, Liz Heldon Productions, and Sandino Maya, um, development director at MGM. Um, and in order to participate actually pitching, we're launching a pitch panel. Nope, we're launching a pitch challenge, um, which is on our contest page and it's free. You just have to um, upload a 90 second pitch onto Vimeo or YouTube and then you enter through our contest page and we're gonna select three winners to be a part of that pitch panel, uh, to pitch to that pitch panel and to win a um, development evaluation, which is $199 value. Before we launch on Wednesday, I'm kind of going backwards for some reason. On Wednesday at two, no, at Wednesday at noon, we're going to do a pitch class so that you can all learn some great tips and tricks um, with Sheila Hanahan Taylor, who produced the American Pie and Final Destination franchises, among others. Um, and she's going to teach us how to pitch. And she's going to call a couple people up to actually pitch and adjust. So that'll get you ready to then submit your pitch for the pitch challenge. I'm Max Tim, I'm the Director of Education with the ISA. I also have my own consulting company called The Story Farm. I work with Felicity and Jaron and Molly and Craig and Shana on uh, the development and pro production side with our uh, company called Creative Screenwriter. Um, for this, the purpose of this uh, little intro, because most of you probably know me just as well as you know Sh Shana, because Shana and I uh, go back and forth here in terms of hosting these events. But on May 20th, I'm going to do a walkthrough of our online course called The Craft Course. Um, and if you can, if somebody can put up thecraftcourse.com, uh, if you want a 12-week course that'll walk you through the development process, whether you are a veteran or a rookie, it's $59 if you enter the code Keep writing CC. So $59 for a 12-week course, audio lectures, video lectures, written lectures, assignments. You get to keep the class forever. Uh, we've reduced that price during this crazy pandemic time. Um, so go check that out. But um, on May 20th, this is a separate thing. It's a free webinar as a walkthrough of the course if you wanted to just kind of get a taste of it first. Hello, uh, my name is Felicity Bren. Uh, this is Community Living in COVID-19. Um, I'm the Director of Development. Screenwriters are my favorite. Um, I managed the development slate with Jaron. It used to be with Max, but Max now is doing other things. Now it's Jaron and I. And we find the next best screenwriters in the world, the entire world, mainly English speaking, that has to be said. And we help promote them and cham champion them and try and put them together with producers and managers and agents, people like Matt, so they can have a career. So if you have a good story and if you have an excellent voice and something to say, then I'm looking for you. Hey guys, I'm Jaron. I'm the uh, creative executive. I work closely with Felicity on Development Slate, finding content, all that good stuff. I'm co-hosting with Shana today on this wonderful panel. Uh, I am so lucky to be represented by Matt Prater, uh, along with uh, Elaine Lowe, who you guys all probably know. Um, so we'll get to some good questions and some state of the industry stuff and all that. Yeah, actually, Elaine was uh, on one of these Zoom events not too long ago. And uh, for everybody that's asking, we had uh, an incredible event just uh, two days ago with Jen Grisanti, the uh, television consultant extraordinaire. And uh, that event as well will be live uh, this weekend. Uh, the, the replay, I should say, of the event will be live this weekend on our Pro Tips and Tricks page. So that's just networkisa.org slash pro tips. 
Uh, also a great place to go. Oh, so by the way, I'm Scott. I didn't get to that. Uh, <laughs> and, and I do all the video work, as you could probably assume. Uh, the camera guy that goes out to the film festivals, which aren't happening right now. Fortunately, we've got such a big backlog of really great festivals we've been to. We still are putting out videos very regularly. Uh, so if you want to uh, take a break from your writing, but still get some inspiration, find our YouTube page. Just type in International Screenwriters Association. You'll find it. Subscribe, ring the bell, all that good stuff. Uh, but also uh, check out our pro tips and tricks page that uh, all those videos that are there as well as some great third party ones that are definitely very inspiring. I'm Carissa, the social media and marketing manager. Um, Molly started to talk a little bit about the virtual pitch challenge that we are launching next week. And I'm very excited about it and you should be too. Um, the way you can find out about it is if you follow us on social, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, we're at Network ISA. I'll plop that down into the chat in a second. Um, but we are having a virtual pitch challenge. It's going to launch on the 13th of May after the pitch class, which I highly recommend you take. It's free. You can find it on our events page. Also put that in the chat. Um, and then after that, we're going to launch and it'll be up for about 48 hours, maybe a little more, 60 hours. You got a little over two days. Um, so we're very excited about that. Follow us on social. You can learn more details. And thank you, Matt, for being here. And thank you, everyone, for being on this call. We're very excited. I'm Danielle. I'm the creative director for the ISA. And I manage our brand as well as I'm working on our website, which includes the ISA Connect membership. And that's the online platform that we've built and are continuing to build out for emerging writers. So you can showcase yourselves to agents, managers, and producers. Thanks everybody for being here. Thank you, Matt. We really appreciate you taking your time on this Friday afternoon. Um, and uh, just welcome to um, another event, a virtual event with the ISA. We're trying to do, as, as it's been mentioned, we're trying to do as many of these as possible to continue to provide plenty of free resources uh for our community which is what we're all about it's about the community we've been serving the community since 2008 and uh going strong growing every day it's because of the support of all the great members um, and the incredible talent we're discovering getting all those uh great writers producers are still reading material and we're getting um that content out to producers um all over hollywood so hopefully when this all you know slows down a little bit and we can get out and start making some films again, uh, we'll be putting you all to work, which will be a lot of fun. So anyway, thank you all again for being here. This is Matt Prater at a Citizen, Citizen Skull Productions. I'll let him talk more about that, Citizen Skull and everything they're doing. Like mm -hmm. I said, I am lucky enough and fortunate enough to be represented by Matt, um, as well as Elaine Lowe, who you guys, Shana, had a wonderful conversation with recently. Um, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to talk to him um, and get his side of uh, what's going on in the industry. and. Um, what managers and stuff are looking for and, and the future of the industry and uh, all that nitty gritty because he's so uh, knowledgeable and fantastic. And I um, uh, wanted to let Matt kind of speak a little bit about Citizen Skull for a bit if you wanted to. Sure, yeah. So hello everyone, thank you guys. Uh, so many of you for tuning in from all over the world, it's pretty cool. Um, Citizen Skull started about a decade ago uh, by my very good friend who's the president and founder of the company, his name is Mark Myers. Um, uh, it started at really primarily in, in production of non-scripted material for various networks like OWN, Animal Planet, uh, Nat Geo Wild, things like that. And then um, kind of eased into narrative feature film as well. About five years ago, um, the management side of the company was launched. And at that time, Mark, actually, we had grabbed a coffee and Mark asked me if I wanted to join his company. I was just coming out of a, a five year long mentorship with a, a producer manager in, in the industry here. And at that time, um, I wanted to start my kind of do my own thing and make my own rules and stuff. So I started my own company, ran that for just about five years. But last summer, uh, if those of you who are in the know in the industry uh, might recall, there were a lot of mergers happening last year. Um, uh, there was talk about one big agency buying another agency and these mergers were happening all over the, uh, on, the on the representation side. So at that time, um, uh, Mark and I connected again about the possibility of merging and I opted to take the opportunity at that time to fold into CSP. And I'm really glad that I did because um, it's a much larger muscle citizen skull um, with, uh, you know, continuing to develop and produce and um, be able to shop um, concepts out to all the major networks, the streamers, production companies, studios, et cetera. And, uh, and now with the state of, of the industry today, um, I don't think that my little 
company would have survived. And I'm, I'm really happy to have um, the, the resources and again, the muscle of a larger company. We have about a dozen managers total with uh, CSP management. Most of that is on camera talent, actors, et cetera. Um, so 70% of our clientele is on camera and then 30% or so is um, uh, literary. So we have directors, producers, writers, couple of showrunners and um, we're actively involved in anywhere from se about seven to 10 uh, narrative features a year. Um, we're still doing documentary filmmaking um, as well. We actually have a big doc on the origins of Sesame Street um, that we did with HBO and Focus Features, which was due to come out this fall, but I think it may push now because of everything. I don't even know if there will be theaters in six yeah. months to, you know, to, to launch through focus features, but they're handling all of our international and stuff too. And then we just, um, we're, we're just setting up another big doc with vice right now. Um, we just sold an animated series to HBO max. So we're, we're really busy all around. We're looking for everything genre wise, every medium um, we're out pitching heavily to all the major networks and the streamers. Uh, and I'm sure we'll get into all that through sort of the Q&A as well, but kind of where the, the state of the industry is. So that's CSP um, in a nutshell. Nice. I think, Shana, you probably wanted to let's, do a couple icebreakers. Let's do a couple little icebreakers first, and then we, we're we getting so many great questions, and we have some questions to get down. So let's uh, we'll do a couple icebreakers, and then we'll just get right to it. Sounds good. Nice. Sound good? Rapid fire icebreakers. Yeah. I love it. Uh, <laughs> Matt, what are you watching right now? Uh, actually, <laughs> believe it or not, right now I'm watching uh, The Last Dance, the Michael Jordan documentary series that's on ESPN. I grew up in the Midwest. I'm from Michigan originally. I was not a Detroit Piston fan as a kid. I was a Michael Jordan, Phil Jackson, Chicago Bull fan from day one even though Jordan was drafted several years before um, uh, Phil Jackson came in to coach. So I'm watching that right now. That's, that's like my obsession right now, but they're only doing, <laughs> they're only launching two episodes a week. So on the scripted side, um, of course, Ozark. Oh my gosh. Anybody who, who saw Ozark this season, the, the finale was, that's just one of the most incredible shows. I think um, I, I just can't get enough of that show. Um, there's another one that I, I actually, it's funny too, because if, if Elaine's tuning into this and I don't know that she is, um, uh, but you can tell her that I, I referred her, um, uh, to, I, I am not okay with this, that Netflix yeah. series. Oh my gosh. Incredible. It's got, there's some fans of that on the ISA team for sure. Yeah. Good. Think, good. Yeah. Cause that Max is one show yeah. just from start to finish, I think is, is darn near just perfect writing. I just love the writing. Yeah. Um, I'm a huge fan of Better Call Saul. I'm, I'm, I'm oh, yeah. uh, almost through the, the new season of that. Um, there's so much good TV and streaming television to watch right now. Um, so <laughs> those are just a few. Fleabag's another one. I'm watching Killing Eve right now, which I think is phenomenal writing. Um, I, yeah, I could probably go on and on and on, and we could just talk about that for the next hour. So right. that's a taste of. We'll do like part two. What's yeah. Matt watching? Yeah, what's Circle Matt back. watching? Yeah. <laughs> um, when you were a kid or younger, besides, you know, Michael Jordan, um, what was like, what movie or show or what made you want to get into entertainment or be in this business? Like, was there Karate something Kid? Yeah. 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 <laughs> it, it, it filled two loves of mine. One, I, I was an only child, so I entertained myself a lot as a child. And that was my first love really was acting. That's kind of what, what kind of got me into the industry more than 20 years ago. Um, so I loved, I loved that, but I was a martial artist as well. And I saw um, Karate Kid in the theater when I was eight years old. And that was it for me. I was like, yeah. somehow, and I didn't know in Michigan how... <laughs> acting class. I was doing, you know, theater in school and community theater and stuff like that, but there was no professional industry where I grew up in, in Northern Michigan. So Karate Kid was it. And then shows like Dukes of Hazzard, um, Chips, <laughs> which I loved. I was like fascinated with California. So I'd watch Chips, you know, and these guys yeah. on motorcycles, all this stuff. So it was a lot of that 80s stuff back in the day, but a lot of TV back then. Yeah. yeah. Matt, that's, as you know, we're writing a a fight movie right now uh and i do a lot of research which is watching stuff karate yeah. kid i just watched again it's one of my favorites also my so wife Beth just watched it for the first time and, the, and, and, and hopefully hopefully people are tuning into cobra kai on youtube because yeah i great. think i think that the fight scene at the end of was it the end of first season or second season now i can't remember which because it's been so long since it was it launched 
um, the fight scene in the sc high school that the kids got into in Cobra Kai was probably one of the best fight scenes I've ever seen. In it was awesome. I mean, just, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> watch Cobra Kai, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Yeah, it's good. Um, and, and anyone who's in our, uh, on our attendees or participants, feel free to put your answers too in the chat. Like what was the, you know, start a conversation. Sweep the leg. Uh, I love Tony just said, sweep the leg. Yep. That That's so good. funny. Nice one. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and then last one, and then we'll kind of dive into some uh, nitty gritty stuff. What is the best piece of advice that you've been given or picked up somewhere? <sighs> okay, the best piece of advice in general, and I, I think this could translate to any industry, but really for the Hollywood industry, is to just take every shot, every shot you get. Actually, yeah. Jaron, you'll know well because you see my email signature on all the emails we have back going back and forth. My favorite quote of all time, I grew up in Hockey Town, USA, which is Michigan, you know, Detroit. Um, I didn't grow up in Detroit. I grew up north of there. But um, Wayne Gretzky, the great Wayne Gretzky said, uh, you miss 100% of the sh shots you don't take. So take every shot. I mean, that's, that's the best advice. And I use that in my daily business every single day. If it, I mean, uh, Elaine Lowe may have told this story. I don't know, you know, if she would have said it when she did this, but um, landing Elaine with her agents at Paradigm was literally a cold call, essentially. I, I reached out to, at the time it was Debbie Klein. She's not there anymore, but I reached out to Debbie Klein and just said, hey, I've got this amazing writer. You should check her out. And I had done that at like all the agencies. I didn't know, I didn't know who this person was, but I knew who, I knew who she was. I didn't know her personally. And that one blind email that I just took a shot um, kind of sent this trajectory last summer. And uh, you know, she's writing history for herself now, which is cool. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right, so Jaren, let's get into the main questions that we have. And I'm going to, if I'm looking away or not, you don't think I'm listening, I am. I'm just sort of navigating questions coming in also. So tag team and everything, so. Right. Uh, yeah. We've got a lot of great questions coming in, it looks cool. like. Yeah, so, we do. Yeah, we'll get to it. Um, so quickly, I wanted to just touch on, and, and I know this already, but I think all the writers wanna know, because um, it's, it's optimistic, um, the state of the industry. You are still working a lot. You're still taking, you know, right? Yeah, oh. yeah, um, development is really busy right now. Uh, it's a great yeah. question. Um, it, things are definitely going to evolve and change, but for writers, I think, I think right now could very well be the best time in history for writers to get their stuff read, wow. to get looked at, to actually pitch. Um, what we're seeing is that um, concepts are, are getting bought up left and right right now. There's like this feeding frenzy from the networks and the streamers in particular. Um, I, it, it's, it seems as though everyone's trying to build up their vault or their coffers because we don't know what the next phase of this COVID-19 might look like. So, so uh, you know, you look at the streamers and stuff. I mean, look, we all know Netflix is sort of the, you know, the mecca for all of, you know, all of scripted content. Um, we don't know how deep they are. We don't know how deep their, their vault is. So at the end of the day, because nothing has been in production for X number of months, excuse me, and it may not be in production for the next several months, um, there is going to be somewhat of a backlog, but we don't know how, we don't know how many things are in development at the networks and the studios and stuff. So there's this weird feeding frenzy happening right now. And we're getting read by people immediately that sometimes used to take weeks to get eyes on our stuff. Um, so now's a really, really productive time on uh, the development end, um, uh, which is great. So, yeah. Yeah. And are those all genres or and all projects or are they looking for like contained things or things that are smaller? You know, we haven't been given mandates that, that specify anything specific. I mean, every platform has their own mandate. Like Netflix, for instance, might only want 10 million and above concepts for feature films or whatever. Well, that could be, you know, anything. So that we haven't been given, you know, there. yeah, we're not, I mean, when the mandates come out, generally once or twice a year, they'll say, you know, this, this platform or this network's looking for family friendly content. Like it's, if it's Disney, we all know that, right? Um, Netflix is looking for high concept star, you know, um, star attachment type stuff. Apple TV is doing the same. They want, they want you to bring um, uh, a certain caliber. Quibi's doing that right now. Quibi's like 100%. That's how they're trying to launch their platform is by having all this A-list talent attached to projects. So, you know, outside of that, I think it's 
I think it's, I don't want to call it the wild west, but I think it's a wide open playing field. Um, as long as it's good, as long as it's dynamic, it's, it's captivating because right now everybody's pitching something. So how do you, how do you rise to the top of that? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so speaking of even to getting to that point, need to get people like you involved. (laughs) Um, And so I think the, let's take it right from the beginning. Do you look at queries? Like how is, how do most of your clients come to you? I know probably referrals, but. um, A lot of referrals. Majority is referral, which is very nice to have because it, that's like the filter process has been done for you when people refer people to you. Um, But yeah, we, I get tons of just blind inquiries um, from around the world weekly. Um, and what attracts me, I'll, I'll open up everything, but, but this is, it's going to sound, it's something hopefully every writer's heard 5 million times through you guys. And just through, you know, going through the process of trying to get representation, proofread your emails, proofread yeah. your pitches. Very important. I'm, I'm so, we're so inundated by hundreds of these on a, on a daily or weekly basis. If I see one grammatical or spelling error in the subject heading or in the body of an email. I'm sorry, guys. I just, I can't, I just can't. I'm like, you're a writer. Yeah, (laughs) I agree. (laughs) It's the most rudimentary thing. And there's programs that you can have on your email that can do that for you. That can proofread. Sorry, there's a bus going by. That can literally proofread your email for you and flag stuff. I'm I'm baffled by that. Yeah. (laughs) Day. no it's a good tip yeah <laughs> yeah just number one just just construct a clear and concise and grammatically and punctually correct <laughs> no, that's so not. so on average though truly because we want to be very truthful and no holds barred yeah. like how how many people would you say you've actually signed or even talked to um based on just a blind query does that happen often or no it doesn't happen very often it's yeah. really got to be unique um yeah I'll provide an example right now of, of another tip that goes with this. There's a guy who reached out to me back in, it was before the holidays. I think it was November. And I was intrigued by the concept that he pitched. He already had, and this will, this will probably go into other questions that you'll see um, coming up. But um, with regard to material, like what kind of material to send initially, um, he had a very intriguing, very simple email introducing himself saying, I have this, this concept. Here's the log line for it. And that was literally it. I read the long line for it, which I was so grateful not to have anything, any attachments. Cause then it's this whole thing of like, I can't open your attachments, you know, unless I request it, our legal team right. will, you know, all that stuff. So um, it was a, it was a log line. I, it was grammatically and you know, everything was right. So I didn't have to proofread <laughs> his email. Um, I emailed him back. I said, Hey, I'd love to see a deck if you have a pitch deck. And that's something that's very, very, instrumental at this stage when you're trying to find a rep is having a pitch deck, even if it's a rudimentary pitch deck that you created on, you know, on your Mac, you know, not using any crazy software, just a couple of visuals and stuff in a document. Um, He sent that over. We kind of went back and forth and then the holidays happened. My family came out. I completely literally forgot about this guy. I hate to say that because I feel bad saying that. (laughs) You're busy. But (laughs) this guy reached out to me again in December once and then in january once and then in february once so he kept following up with me to say hey we had a nice exchange i'm just circling around i know you're busy um and i literally am reading now reading his pilot and i'm probably going to sign him this coming week i'm probably going to offer that because he has kept it very simple he hasn't harassed me so to speak he's just kept in touch hey here here's another update for you matt here's what i have going on since a month ago or whatever it is and I, it, he's taken the liberty of starting to develop a relationship with me, whether I'm giving back to it or not, right. he's developing <laughs> the relationship. And I have to say, I, I commend the guy for that. Sure. Like that it's is something you like. That's the definition of persistence yeah. and without being, you know, over, without going overboard, it's such a delicate balance that, you know, but so anyway. When that, do you think, when do you think though, for example, like if, if he kept reaching out to you, like when is enough enough? When are you? I'll tell you, I'll, I'll straight up. I'll, I, I have no problem telling someone, look, I'm not interested, but this guy, because I was interested in the concept, I'm interested in X, Y, and Z. That's a different story. If I'm not interested, 
one of the things people will appreciate, hopefully, is that I will straight up just tell you, look, it, it didn't, it didn't tip the needle for me. You know, yeah. best of luck. I'll yeah. be honest, because I don't. I've been in that place before as a writer, as an actor, as a director and a producer, where you know you just feel like you're getting strung along. I don't like to string people along. I really don't. That's like great. To do that. So yeah, yeah. Um, that uh, that is awesome. I think the key there was that you uh, had expressed interest initially, though, too. So he knew yeah. that there was some interest there, and then Definitely. respectfully kind of reached yeah. out. Yeah, that's great. Um, I have a question, uh, and I'll involve an anecdote. Um, okay. Around, but it, it kind of leads into Autumn's asking this question right now, and that's um, do managers ideally lean towards prospective writers as a spectrum of scripts or whatever? Um, anecdotally, Jesse, I have a co-writer, Jesse. Uh, yeah. Matt represents both of us. Um, back in like 2015 or so, it was a while ago, this, when we, we wrote our first script together, we got some good notes, some good coverage on the blacklist, and we were like, great, time to go out. <laughs> we had one script. Uh, we threw, um, we just queried some people and someone was interested because we won a contest. And he read the script and was like, this is great, you guys, I'd like to bring you in for a meeting. And, um, and to me, being in a, an inexperienced and not knowing, I was like, this is, this is it. Let's start looking at houses to buy. Like we're, we're good. <laughs> and we went in and it was a very nice, very cool meeting. And he was like, cool. What else do you guys got? Yeah. And you're like, well, we're working on a thing right now. And he was like, okay, keep me updated. And I was so crushed after that. I was so disappointed. I was like, why didn't we get signed? What's the deal? Not knowing that that is, that is, that's the usual route is like, if you get a manager interested, they're going to want to talk to you. They're going to kind of feel you out. And then they're going to ask for other stuff. And, um, you know, it, it took Jesse and I a while to kind of not only find our voice, but build up a library of stuff and really kind of map out how we wanted, like a plan that we wanted to have. And then when we talk to managers, they can, um, you know, respond to that plan or not. And uh, so I wanted to talk, like, it, it, do you often sign people based off just one script or do you want to find out, if, or do they have a lot of projects going or do they have kind of a plan in place? That's a, that's a really great question. And you'll hear my daughter here because my, my wife's trying to pull her off, off the path. You know. It's okay, Ellery. I'll be done in a little bit. <laughs> Poor thing. She's a three-nager now. So she's, you know, she knows everything. She can go wherever she wants. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's, a, that's a great question. Honestly, I am not a fan of, of uh, and forgive the term, it's such a, a, a terrible term to use, but a one-trick pony. That's mm -hmm. how I feel about people who only have one property. Um, the first thing that I do before I'll even take a meeting with someone is, is if I like a property and I, again, going back to this example, I was giving about this guy who I've been in communication with. I said, uh, I like this concept. It's great. What else do you have? Because what ends up happening is, is if we set up a meeting for a client and you go in there and you pitch this concept and you know, some exec walks in who knows nothing about it and hears and goes, ah, and it's now we've already got that. What else do you have? And you have nothing else. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> we just we can't do that. So at the end of the day, um, you have to have a portfolio of of. Con I would say I'm a real big fan of the of the number three. I just think there's something about the power of three that um, that in in any life situation to me it just it, it's something I live by. So I would say have at least three concepts in your portfolio. Do those, do those concepts have to be in the same genre? Do they, can you be like diff, like how much, how important is it to sort of have a brand of like, I'm a horror writer or I'm a so-and-so writer or comedy, or can you jump around to different genres? It's a great question. I think when you're just starting out, um, the industry is going to dictate to an extent what genre you're going to be uh, working in because you might have, uh, you might think you're a really great comedy writer and you may end up working in drama. <laughs> I mean, that's just the nature of, of the business, you know? So I would say when you're first starting out, have a, have a really strong, have, pick, pick three genres that you enjoy writing in. If you, if, if that works for you and then have something in each genre to say, here's what I have. I wrote this horror film. I have this, this, you know, comedy film and I have this, this action or whatever, you know what I mean? And then, you know, whether you're talking to your peers, which I highly advise as being your first level of your filter as a writer, like give it to your friends, other people who are writers, the ISA come to you guys, you know, organizations like you guys who can give valuable feedback or whether it's screenplay competitions or whatever it might be. Um, try to figure that out for yourself before you start approaching 
me because if I have to help you figure that out, that tells me that it's a little too early in your career for me necessarily to, to get involved. I want what I'm looking for and what most literary managers and agents are looking for are properties that are either ready or they're, they're in development toward getting ready that I can go out and they're a home run and I can go out and sell them. Because that's is where pitch decks come in too, right? That's where the decks come in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah very important. And someone's asking that should all, if you have three ideas, should all three have pitch decks? Uh, yes, I would say. And Matt has, an, has uh, kind of hammered this into us too. Yeah. Um, and now we use this with our development slate writers and stuff too. Pitch decks that's are great. very important. Yeah. But I, I would say also pitch decks, I think, should come first. Um, and maybe a lot of I would agree. That. I yeah. would agree. And I, I'll, what I see now happening is um, writers, clients are developing their decks before they start writing their pilot or their feature yeah. or whatever it is, because they're treating the deck like a treatment, essentially. Yeah. And the nice, what I love about a deck um, is the visuals that you would put into your deck. It's like your vision board for your concept. Everyone's heard of a vision board at this point in history, I'm sure. Right. So, <laughs> you know, you're, you're basically visualizing what your concept should feel like the tone, what the characters are like um, all that development goes into your deck if, if then you're starting to write your, your, your concept, whatever, if it's a pilot or feature, whatever, and you get stuck, go back to your deck like you would a treatment, right? And, and, and get back in that mind, like look at that yeah. character and have a visual representation and that'll inspire you to, to, to get over whatever hump or you know, wherever you're stuck. I think the deck, for us, the deck is, it's the calling card, it's the business card. It's the first yeah. thing we go out with. It's so important, it's more important to me, to us today, than anything else you have in your material. The, 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 the actual script behind it is the second most important thing. Yeah. So. Um, quickly, because I, I think we got, I want to get to some of the questions coming in because I think uh, we got a lot of people asking questions. I wanted sure. to just touch on um, the branding of stuff. And I, lo I love your answer, Matt, because uh, that was something I grappled with for a long time. As we started in comedy, I think our the first thing you read of ours is Borderline, which is like a horror -y thriller thing. But then yeah. you to an action comedy of ours and we do all sorts of stuff but what we'd like to tell our development slate writers is your branding doesn't necessarily mean i only do horror or whatever your branding could be like i do this kind of character and this kind of story and these are the kind of genres that fit best with those so like i like to tell this kind of story I like these kinds of movies or shows i can do this kind of story like jesse and i would like to do action comedy or horror because those are the ways that we best express ourselves so um yeah um just wanted to hit on let's that. let's rewind just one second because we're getting a bunch of things about pitch decks so pitch deck lookbook kind of they go hand in hand with each other i mean you we people are it, de it kind of depends but um how detailed do you like them to be because a lot of people are like well i don't have a graphic designer and i don't have like a you know no, it, it doesn't have to be like that i mean it, it you can go on google and find you know actors that represent the characters that you're writing about and you can pull a photo off of Google and slap it on a P and make a PDF document. I mean, it can be that literally that rudimentary as long as there's something there. So if you do send me that deck, I have a visual representation of what you're thinking for your characters. Um, you know, um, a cover page for it to say, this is what I feel like the tone of my concept would be like, and um, go from there. I mean, we have somebody in house at our company who builds our decks for our clients as well. So and it does that too. Yeah, which is great. There you go. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, at the end of the day, um, um, you know, when it comes to creating something, whether it be, you know, through you guys, the ISA, or, or if you have a, a manager or an agent who can do it as well, um, you know, we have a, we have a, a certain level of professionalism that we want to go out with as a company. So um, we will work with our clients to, to pull visuals and to ensure that the deck looks, you know, as professional as it possibly can. The most important aspect of the deck, in my opinion, to answer your question, um, I think is, is to be as detailed as possible about the story, the concept, um, the, uh, the characters, the background, the description, all that stuff. The more detail that's in there initially, the more it shows a literary rep how much of your homework you've done. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's you know, crucial for us to see like, wow, this person's, they've prepped, they've really done a lot of work on this. I do get pitches sometimes where I literally think to myself, like, did you just throw this together? There's no thought behind this. Like, yeah. come on, man, you know? Yeah. So and you can tell. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I hate to say, but you know, put yeah. really, think about, 
think about what you're trying to accomplish when you come out for, for literary representation, what you're tr trying to accomplish. You're trying to find somebody who is willing to become your professional best friend with no guarantee of a profit. I mean, that's really what it boils down to. You know, every client we take on, we, we are investing our time and our energy into hopefully sell and make money from someday, but there's no yeah. guarantee of that. Yeah. So every client that I work with until they make money, um, I'm essentially donating my time, my energy, you know, that's, that's really like the, the, the I don't know if that's too, <laughs> too much. No, it's good. That's, it's good but for people like, to know. I think people forget that. Totally honest, you know, yeah. that's at the end of the day. I mean, I have two kids, a mortgage, you know, like I want to make money like everybody else. And so I, I want to work with people that I feel really excited about. And I feel like, yeah, we can go out and make some money together. Let's do this. You know? Yeah. That's, yeah. Hey, I'm going to go to a, a question from um, somebody. We're going to let Lori. Let's do it. Um, so I was wondering, what are the kinds of questions that we should be asking a manager during a meeting so we can figure out if we're a good fit in, ter in terms of working styles? There are so many different questions based on what you're, you know, where you're at in your career, I think. So um, if you're just starting out, and we call that a development client. If you're just a development client, you're trying to build your portfolio and get some things out there. Um, I think great questions to ask would be, um, do you have any writers, you know, like me on your roster? I think that's, that's maybe, you know, and like me, what I mean by that is with something similar to what I'm bringing to the table as a writer. Um, Cause there's only so many ideas at the end of the day. And if you live in LA, I mean, now it, what I love about the internet and ISA and, you know, organizations like you guys is you've really shrunk the world, right? So um, the artistic community, the creative community is so small today. Uh, a joke that I make with clients is if you have this idea, we need to hone in on it and get it out there because somebody else is going to come up with it sooner or later. So that's the number one question. One of the first questions I would ask is, is just to say, do you have anything like what I have, what I'm bringing to the table? Do you have anything like this in, you know, in your, por in your company's portfolio or on your roster right now? Um, demographics play a huge role today as well, believe it or not. Uh, and I don't know, you know, how much of that is shared today with prospective literary clients, uh, writers who want to get in the industry, but, um, the, the major networks, the major production companies, the studios are, looking for certain age ranges of writers in certain demographics. Um, minorities are, are, is very, it's very popular to have minority writers today on TV shows. And um, uh, it's the best time in history, to be honest, for that. So uh, pull in all, voices, all your, to pull in voices that haven't historically been involved. Yeah, much, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's so, the future. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, but circling back to the, to the original question of other questions to ask, um, uh, I think the, the sort of the macro idea would be to say, what do you need, Mr. Or Mrs. Manager, or Mr. Or Mrs. Agent? What do you need? What can I bring to you? What can I do for you? Because I think there's this, this long time stigma with talent and having been a represented actor and a, a writer myself in the past and a producer, um, there, there was this stigma of like, what can you do for me, Mr. Agent, Mrs. Agent, or Mr. Manager, Mrs. Manager? And instead of asking that question today, it's, it's got to be the opposite of what can I bring? What can I bring to Citizen Skull? What are you guys looking for? What do you need? You know? Um, and I think that is probably, if someone asks me that question, they earn my respect like that. Like, no, that, that's the end all be all for me. Because then I can sit back and go, well, what we really are looking for you know, uh, Netflix or this production company or this producer is looking for this. Do you have that? You know? Yeah. So that's, I think, a, a profound thing to keep in mind when you're getting in the room to meet with someone. Oh, career longevity. Is that the same kind of thing that you're looking towards? Yeah. I mean, yes, absolutely. I'm as much as I would love to make a million dollars off a client tomorrow. I would love to make a hundred million with you over the next 20 years. So I'm every client that I consider bringing into the mix. Um, uh, I, I'm going to be working with you ideally for a very long time. Um, and this goes back to my mentor um, who's been in the industry for decades. Uh, one of his top clients was um, Jackie Collins, the, the famous 
author who, you know, wrote all those romance novels. Mm -hmm. She passed away now several years ago. She was his client for 30 years or something like that. And she is the top selling uh, female author in the world with over a half a billion novels or something crazy like that, that she sold worldwide. So he would tell me, he's like, you know, I treat, I treat my clients like family. They are family to me. And I, I want to work with them for the rest of their careers if I'm so lucky. So that's, that's how I look at it with my clients. And that's why I don't have 5 million clients either. I, I keep it very small, very tight. Cause I, I'm going to, you know, Jaron knows like we, we have check-ins and we communicate. I mean, that's just how I, I prefer to operate. How do you yeah. know that it's time for somebody to be, you know, off your roster? Are they not doing the work on their own? Are they relying on you? Are they just not doing the work? Good question, Shana. Yeah, and that that's such what a- What I'm in very interested in. <laughs> <laughs> How do we get As Jared well, off? Be, no. Okay. No. Um, I, think, I think communication is a big deal to me. I wanna know what you're up to. And I have some clients that literally communicate with me every day, whether I care about it or not, like I hear from them. <laughs> but to be honest, I love that because that tells me what they're up to. And I would rather know more frequently what you're doing than have to poke you every month and be like, dude, I haven't heard from you, you know? Like what, what's going on? So I would say, you know, there are several factors that come into play um, with regard to parting ways with the client, if it comes to that. Uh, number one for me is a lack of communication, which to me also, um, kind of reads as like a lack of motivation on their part to be doing what they need to be doing. Um, as writers, I'm a firm believer that you need to be writing and creating every single day, no excuses. And right now with, with this quarantine, Jaron better have like 400 scripts read because <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. My friend. No, you know, we're working, you know. but I know you you're we're working on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But that's, that's yeah. the point though, is Jaron, he calls me up the other day. Hey man, I got an update for you. So I get on the phone. What's going on, buddy? What, tell me about it. Well, we got this and we're working on that and we're doing this. And one thing that, and this may go into other, answer other questions too, but one of the things that I love to do with clients, including Jaron and Jesse, is I love to say, great. So when are you going to have a draft for me to read? And I yeah. let, I let the client determine what their due date is or what their ETA is. And then I put, when they tell me, then I put it on my calendar with reminders and then I'll poke them and say, Hey, we're a week out from that date that you, that ETA, you yeah. to me. but it helps <laughs> you as a writer. It helps you hold yourself accountable. And that's everything in my opinion. Exactly. I like the accountability. Yeah. It's, it's hugely helpful and great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm going to jump to another question. I'm in an interesting position that before the lockdown, I got my first in-room pitch meeting and uh, I'm doing this. First of all, congratulations. Oh, thank yeah. you so much. Thank that's, you. That's, <laughs> I, got goose, I have goosebumps for you because I know how long that and how hard it is to get that. And when you finally get that, <laughs> you should be celebrating. For thank sure. you so much. It, it, it's been pretty good. Like the last person whose hand I shook was a TV producer. So I'm like, maybe that means something. Maybe that's <laughs> I, I will not watch this. <laughs> <laughs> Remember the handshake? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and I don't have representation. So I got this on my own Agreed. because I'm into bothering people. And um, I, I just wanted to know if there's anything I should look out for, any pitfalls, since, uh, you know, if I'm going into the room or even if I'm doing via Zoom on my own without the rep. Uh, yeah, what should, what, what should I be careful of besides copywriting my material? Which well, I yeah, I mean, you, that should be a given. Copywriting should be before you even get, you know, before you even get the opportunity to get a meeting with someone, you should have your material copywritten. So that's number one. But I, I would say there's no, there really aren't any pitfalls, in my opinion, unless, unless that person is so bold to start talking numbers with you about money or contract or trying to get any kind of verbal agreement out of you that's the kind of stuff that i would i would then say casually like yeah i'll talk to my my reps about that even if you don't have reps at the moment you know <laughs> just be like yeah i'll talk to my reps about that because um what you the the biggest pitfall in my opinion is committing in any way shape or form whether it be verbally or in writing to uh to somebody else's schedule or you know their desire for commitment from you or whatever without thinking it through and, and really getting your head around what that means. And that's, I think part of, you know, that is part of my responsibility with my clients is to go over that contract or that option agreement or whatever that is and say, do you really want to spend your time doing this? Do you really want to, you know, is it worth the, the money they're offering you? 
um, Jaron can attest to, I, I like to, to speak from a, a place of um, like real estate because that's what scripts and, and, and concepts are. It's IP, right? It's intellectual property. So I always talk about, you know, when an option comes around and I just had this conversation with, with a, a prospective client who's not a client yet. Um, and, and I was told, yeah, they offered me X amount of dollars for six months and, I, and it was a very low number. And I, I literally said, if you, if you, where, you know, where you live right now, if you own your apartment or your condo or your house, would you be comfortable letting someone come in and rent that a room or, or your place mm. from you for six months for that amount of money? Yeah. Would you be cool with that? And, she, and this person was like, no. I said, <laughs> well, that's ultimately what you're doing. When someone wants to option your material, you're giving, you're renting it to them, meaning nobody else can live there. Nobody else can have that property for a certain amount of time. Um, so either whatever they're offering monetarily, which we all know, in this industry that people don't pay for options anymore. It's sad, you know, it's very rare. Um, but those are things that you have to think about when it comes to um, uh, those pitfalls that you can avoid. What I would do if I were you, uh, and a long answer to, a, to a, a somewhat simple question, Luna, is take the opportunity to now go out and knock on some managers and agent stores and say, hey, I have this, this meeting that I landed myself. That shows you're ambitious, that you're, you're out there hustling. That shows an agent or a manager a whole lot about who you are as a person, that you're a hustler. And that's very important to us as well. See, that's a good question that I was going to ask you too. It's, there's this thing that said like, don't reach out to managers until you're doing something because they'll find you. So it's like this thing of like, well, wait until they come to you. But then, you know, it, I, I like that. Of like you're doing the work. And so when you have something going on, go ahead and start reaching out and say, I have this going on. Best time, best time, best absolutely time. best time to do it. I think rather than, rather than going hat in hand, meaning you don't have anything going on, you're just looking for representation. Uh, you'll hear this often from people in the industry saying, um, you have nothing to represent yet. You're not there yet. Um, even if you have three projects in your portfolio, you may hear that, but those you know, writers that are out there doing what Luna is doing and, and hustling and getting in, you know, getting something set up or a meeting or whatever, my, even if it's just a coffee at a cafe with somebody who produced a movie five years ago, whatever, you know, like that's something. And that's something that you can then talk about and say, hey, here's what I'm doing. Um, I would love your guidance or assistance in any way. You know, uh, what do you think? And, and when I yeah. get those kinds of inquiry emails from people that do that, that say, hey, I've been hustling. Here's what I'm doing. Here's a meeting I have coming up, or here's an option I was just given. Um, I need help. I'm more apt to say, sure, man. Even if I don't take you on as a client, I am more apt to say, sure, I'll take a look at it for you and, and give you my two cents, you know? Yeah. It ties into what you were saying earlier about like, what can, uh, uh, for a prospective client to say, how can I help you? To a manager, yes, yes. Luna. That's a great. That's a great. That's great, perfect, right there. You could say, "How can I help? I can bring this to you. I have yeah, this, yeah, yeah. this pitch." Absolutely. All right, right, we have another question, Chelsea. Uh, so I was wondering, like, when you're looking for representation, do you want a manager who has similar things to you, or do you want to be like the one different, standout client kind of thing? I think it's going to depend on the manager, or the agent. To be honest. Um, um, like right now, when I think of my roster, I think of, I have several clients that have horror genre projects, um, but they're all unique in their own way, you know? So I don't personally have an issue with, with having similar thing, you know, of that nature on my, on, on the roster. But if there could certainly be conflicts at some point, I could see if I have a television series concept with one client and then another client has something that's so similar. I'm like, oh, and right now, just so everyone knows right now, it's all about pandemic backgrounds, right? Like every, I, I, I'm getting, I can't even, I lost track of how many pitches <laughs> I've received that are like, so we have this pandemic backdrop and this is yeah. going on. It's like, yeah, everybody has one of those right now. You know? <laughs> yeah. So that's um, a little bit tricky to navigate, but I, I don't, I don't, I can't give a concrete answer because I think everyone's a little bit different. So I would say as long as the material is really well-written, it's unique. Um, that's really all we're looking for. It could be, 
you know, it, it, yes, if, if, uh, if you have something you pitch to me and I'm like, God, this is so well written, but it's so close to something we're already out pitching, we may say no thanks. But then my next question is going to be, what else do you have? Because you're a good writer. <laughs> Ties back to that. You know? Yeah. yeah. Or, or one of the questions I love to ask as well to anybody um, is, tell me your list of ideas that you have. Because every writer has, a, a, you know, 500 ideas on a list. Tell me what your, what your ideas are. They're and, like, let me roll out the scroll. Yeah, here. Seriously. And, like, <laughs> seriously. And, and I, I love that because what that tells me as a rep is this person has 10 to 20 years in them of, of a career ahead of them because they're, they're constantly building their ideas. They're coming up with new ideas. April is up next. <laughs> oh, gosh. Thank you so much for doing this. I've learned so much. And I say I appreciate everything you all have been doing. Um, and I've enjoyed all of these. So. Um, I'm, um, I live in North Carolina. Uh, I'm uh, a senior writer. And um, I guess my question is, what, how do I uh, even begin to um, get interest or uh, present my material to people uh, in LA to see if they might even be interested? I'm a comedy writer mostly, and I have a writing partner, and uh, we have a lot of fun doing it, but and we have some good ideas, but now I, I need to know what to do with it now. Yeah, well, if, if you have been tuning into this, you know, we were talking earlier about, about putting together a deck, a pitch deck. Um, what I, something that I ha have personal experience with uh, regarding writers of a certain age who may not be in their 20s or 30s, and necessarily hip to all the lingo and all the, the different, you know, sort of materials that we're used to talking about in, in the entertainment industry. What I find is that, and, and this happens regularly. It, I mean, it, it just happened uh, at least, at least once or twice this week where someone pitched something to me and I said, uh, do you have a deck you can share with me? I don't know what a deck is, I, I, you know, or whatever. I'm, I'm done. I just can't. <laughs> like, you have to be educated on what, the current lingo is in the industry and, and when when so you know in sort of answering your question on where to start start by looking at decks and how to build a deck a visual representation we were talking about about what your concept is about um that's that in my opinion is the calling card or the business card the first thing that you should go out with no matter what your age you could be you know, in your nineties and writing your first screenplay. I don't care if you have a deck you can send me, I will look at it, you know? So, but there, there is, and, and I think everyone's privy to this. There is a severe case of ageism in our industry. Um, so, you know, that a lot of people have that going against them. And if you are of a certain age and you're writing and you're trying to get off the ground, you're trying to get representation, you're trying to get out there and, and get things going for your career, um, you really have to have your, your research done and know what the industry is looking for. Know what a deck is, first of all. Um, be able to, to put together a rudimentary deck with some visuals and, and your concept and your character development and stuff. Um, if, if I come across somebody, actually, I, I, I did. It was probably within the last month. Forgive me, because when I, when I try to use a timeline, I, I call it the COVID calendar. I can't remember what week it is yeah. Yeah. or... So I'm like, I think it was it's a month a ago. It may, it may, yeah, it may yeah. have been last week, but it, it feels like a year ago. I don't know. But <laughs> there is a, there's a writer from New York, from Long Island, who is of a certain age. And I'm reading all of this person's material right now. And I'm like, wow, this is, this is a really strong writer. This person is uh, placed highly in some competitions, won a couple competitions, et cetera, but they've never been produced. So I'm, I'm you know, looking at this material and I say, what about a deck? Boom, here's a deck. And I mean, this person's gotta be in their 50s or 60s at least. And I'm impressed by that because this person knows what I'm looking for. If I request it, they have it. So I think, you know, that's, that's probably the best advice I could give to you right now on, you know, being of a certain age, getting out there, trying to knock on some doors, uh, and then just make sure that your material is as, tight as possible that you've done the work and you've got a, a complete story and it's provocative it's intriguing it's grammatically correct and all <laughs> that stuff you know yeah I, if i can add real fast april uh 
that Matt mentioned contests and competitions and stuff too, and people do look at that, but I, I, uh, I have the unique position of being on both sides of this, right? I'm represented by Matt. I work for the ISA. I see the contest. I look for content. Um, what I think a lot of writers don't, don't process about contests is a lot of them get bummed out when they don't win or, or final or, or the finalist or something, but I think contests are best used as a barometer for if your material is up to par and out to good to get to managers and agents and stuff like that. So we see a lot of writers that constantly place as a semifinalist or a quarter finalist. And we know that those writers, that's someone to look at. And we know that their writing is probably up to par. Um, so that's another good way too, is just submit to contests. And if you're constantly kind of placing quarter final, semifinalist, you know, okay, I, I think this is, the script's good to go right now. I'm gonna put together some pitch decks and maybe start reaching out to managers. It's a great barometer. Absolutely, Jaren. Yeah. We even have put together, well, we called it a reel, but I guess it's a sizzler. A sizzle. Um, yeah, a sizzle. So we, we have something put together that, um, that we could also, and it, actually it's on my ISA stuff right now with all the, my, the, the pilot. It's a pilot, a 30 minute pilot that we're trying to promote. So um, th are those the things that you are interested in as well? And I, I'm taking a, a deck is more like a lookbook. Um, yeah, 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 it is. It's, it's kind of a, a deck is kind of like a lookbook and a Bible combined. If they, oh, okay. they had a baby, that's a, that's a deck. <laughs> um, but I will say a sizzle. Here's the thing about sizzles. If, if you're producing a sizzle yourself, it's the production value has got to be fantastic. Otherwise it's, if it's, yeah, I, I hate to use the term amateur, but if it's amateur, that can literally, you could shoot yourself in the foot before you even get the opportunity if you just go out with a sizzle. So, uh, and, and I use this example earlier of this person who has been, con you know, I've been in contact with, they sent me um, the pilot, uh, I have, I'm reading the pilot script now, but they sent me a deck and they sent me a short film that they actually did, which is a proof of concept for their pilot. And this, this, short film it's outstanding i mean the production mm. value I, i'm just i was like thinking to myself wow they put a lot of resources into getting this thing done that's to me showing a level of commitment to what they're trying to do the a, a major pitfall that you'll see a lot of times is people say yeah i got this sizzle and then they like shot it in their backyard you know, and, and the, you know, using the dog as a talent. I, I don't know. I mean, it, it could be great, but it's, it's really got to be of a certain caliber in order to be an adequate representation of what you're trying to sell. And there's, there's 99 out of hundred examples where that doesn't, it just doesn't work. It, and it, and it ultimately hinders you rather than helping get your material forward. Um, so, you know, be cautious with that is what I would suggest or recommend. They always say like the path to getting an agent is actually you talk, you know, you get become friends with the junior agent or the assistant, someone who's working their way up. Um, I just finished some projects and is there a similar path to trying to find a manager? Like you find a junior manager or, you know, they hit pocket you for something that you have. Hmm. There's no wrong way to eat a Reese's. It's really how I look at it. <laughs> <laughs> There's no wrong way. I mean, yes, you could have the junior. I, I've been through that where I, I, I don't even remember how I met the junior agent and became friends with the junior agent, which ended up landing me representation. Like, so yeah, that is definitely one way to do it. Um, but there's no wrong way. I mean, it, it really, you know, I, I don't have a junior manager that works under me. I have a, an intern assistant who reads scripts who wants to be a literary manager. Um, I started that way. I did a five year mentorship where all I did was read scripts and um, uh, deal with clients and read contracts, 100 page studio contracts, which if I had the time and energy and in second life, I would become an entertainment attorney at the same time. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, I wish I could give you something more concise, but there's just no, there's really no wrong way to do it. All path leads. Yeah. Yeah, yeah ultimately. Any way yeah. you go. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, now we're, you wanna do a follow up, Jaren? Oh, it, you can, uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to say that, that I, I used to hear that a lot. It's like, oh, everyone's got a different path. Mm -hmm. And I was like, but really, what's the path? But, but, it is, but it is absolutely true. Everyone has a different path and they all are equally valid. They all work. But I also want to say this. 
don't use somebody like don't become friends with somebody who's an assistant or something and yes, and and be point, friends Tana. with them because you're trying to get in somewhere with like their boss or something right. that is not okay yeah if you want to be friends and nice to somebody yes make friends with somebody but don't be a user like that For all connections i would yeah, hope user. that yeah. most people today can smell that a mile away and not Hopefully. allow it to happen you know? mm -hmm. but yeah you're right you, you just never know yeah. yeah yeah all right so we have a good one from tony would you say, is there a distinct approach for writers who largely want to be writers for hire versus writers who mainly want to finance and sell their own scripts? Mm. Uh, yes and no. Um, you, if you want to be a writer for hire, say you want to like work in a staff writing position on a show, um, mm -hmm. then you're going to want to beef up your portfolio with um, sample scripts from shows. Uh, to show that you can write in that format, whatever that format is, if it's half hour, or if it's an hour, whatever it might be, uh, network, major network versus streamer, things like that. Um, if you're if you're looking to um, uh, sell your own stuff, then uh, you just need to have something that's ready for network or or whatever platform you know you're ultimately aiming for. Like if you want to write something specifically for uh, ABC. You know, you're thinking it's Disney owned, it's family, it's, or, or it's along those lines. It should be something like that, that represents. Um, but yeah, we, I mean, I, what I, what I noticed today is people aren't, people do not really care as much for um, sample scripts from current series uh, for consideration for writing jobs. They want to see something original and unique. Uh, from a writer to see what their voice, what they're bringing to the table as a voice. Um, so that's, I think, more so today than ever, uh, focusing on original original material. What, with uh, the perfect example with Elaine, um, we go out with uh, with this you know particular concept of hers that she wrote that's won all these competitions and got her into her HBO Writer Fellowship and like all the stuff that she did. Um, we use that um, as a calling card for her when we set up, you know, a lot of meetings, an hour long serial drama, basically. Uh, and that has landed her a ton of open doors. So that, that actually won uh, ISA's table read and a couple of years ago too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was when I first started with the ISA. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think we're going to start wrapping up um, just cause uh, we know you have uh, two kids, Matt, and one of them trying uh -huh. to get on the <laughs> panel and we are so thankful that you uh, gave us your time. Sure. Um, yeah, uh, one thing I wanted to, um, to talk to you about lastly mm -hmm. is, um, um, the concept of, uh, I think when people get managers and stuff, um, they don't know how much work they still have to put in or whatever, but, uh, but you recently, yeah. very recently had a talk with me about, um, rewriting stuff, um, and how much you rewrite and how much, and you had this great anecdote about the writer of the help, right? Um, oh yeah, yeah. yeah and I think that'd be great for a lot of the writers to hear. Uh, I know it's a general yeah. anecdote, but um, sure, yeah. But it's it's really something that hopefully will inspire, you know. And that's that's the idea of that. That what I like about that story is that it it's an inspiring story. So hopefully writers will be inspired by it. Uh, and before I get to that, I just want to say, you know, everyone's heard this. Who's a writer? Writing is rewriting, and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting and, rewriting and just honing it and honing it and honing it. Uh, so the best example of that, which I was talking to Jaron and uh, Jesse about recently, was with regard to the lady who wrote the book, The Help, which later became the Oscar. You know, not I don't I can't remember. Did The Help win the Oscar? Or was it just nominated? Because um, um, I know that a couple of the talent in The Help won Oscars for their work uh, in it. But anyone who remembers the the movie The Help, the period piece about uh, the the woman working in the um, uh, plantation, uh, and I'm f totally forgetting her name. Who played the role, the lead in that? Uh, uh, but um, anyway, Spencer. Yeah. Yeah, Spencer, yeah, yeah, <laughs> thanks. she won the Oscar for that role, I believe. So the woman who wrote the book, who then the movie is based off the book, she. I read this story about her, and, and others. Feel free to correct me in the comments if if I'm wrong, because you may have read it too. But uh, it was several years ago, and I read the article. But it said that she she wrote this manuscript, and then she tried to. To, she gave it to like every publisher in New York and was rejected by every single publisher that she gave this manuscript to with some of them with pretty good notes. So she went back, rewrote the manuscript, rewrote it again and again and again, and kept putting it back out and getting all these rejections for years. This happened 
And then I think it got to a point where she was so obsessed with getting this manuscript right to be able to sell it to a publisher that she ended up like renting a hotel room and like literally having an affair with her manuscript. <laughs> so she would, and I, and I think for, if I remember correctly, it may have even like destroyed her marriage that she had like all of this wow. craziness because she was obsessed with rewriting and rewriting and rewriting her script. Well, all that finally led to the book being published, becoming a New York times bestseller. The movie ended up being made. And if I remember correctly, and I had said this to Jaren, I think it was her brother, the writer's brother who ended up directing it. It was like his directorial debut. <laughs> in the movie. So yeah. anyone who might know this story will probably be like, that's not how it happened. This is what it, but anyway, that's how I remember it. But, but the general tenets of it remain the inspirational yeah, part of it. Yeah. yeah is, is, you know, don't, don't give up, you know, people, I try not to just reject people outwardly and say, no, this is terrible. I'll, you'll never hear me say that. I'll, I'll say like, no, this just doesn't do it for us or whatever. Sometimes I'll, if I have the time or the, the brain power, I'll, I'll let people know what didn't work for me. Um, but that's rare. And that's, it's rare that you'll ever get that when you're sending an inquiry to a manager or an agent for representation. You're not gonna, they're not gonna tell you what didn't work for them. Um, ultimately, they just don't, we don't have time to get into all that. But there are so many resources like with the ISA uh, where you can get valuable feedback, coverage, things of that nature. I highly recommend that. That helps you hone your craft. And then just keep, just keep at it. Keep writing. Keep rewriting and getting it out there. And sooner or later, uh, I think that's, that's, the one, that's the one sort of guarantee in this industry is, is having a tenacious spirit. Yeah. So, that's the path that most always works is just keeping it out. Yeah. Yeah. Hi guys, welcome back everyone. Hi. Your lovely faces. Um, any last words? Matt, again, I wanna thank you so much, man. Uh, really appreciate you coming on here and uh, offering all these valuable insights and talking it out with everyone. And uh, we know we'll see you again in a couple of weeks on the pitch panel, which will be great. Looking forward to that as well. No, thank you for having me guys. I really appreciate it. It's fun to be able to share insight and connect with so many great people. And I'm grateful to, uh, to you, Jaron, and to the ISA in general for, uh, for being a great resource and supporting so many great uh, writers out there. Um, and I'm grateful for everything it's done for, uh, for Elaine as well, because yeah. she's had some great times with you guys. So thank you for all that support. <laughs> we are thank you so her. much for your, for answering all those crazy questions everywhere. I mean, <laughs> such good information. And yeah. I think that um, people will walk away feeling a little bit, you know, if not a lot more knowledgeable about kind of the, the mirage that is a manager and what that means. I hope so. so. I hope. Take every shot. You miss 100% of the shots yeah. you don't take. There but I just want to add on to the, the last little um, the sentiment you had there. This is a quote that always stayed with me. When I first got out to LA, someone told me, the only way to fail at this business is to stop trying. And yeah. I, I feel like if you live your whole life going after it, and if you, if you don't succeed, you spent your whole life following your dream. And that's a life well spent, I, I feel. Yeah, I was put it down. The path, it's, the, it's all about the path. I mean, look, at the end of the day, the goal for anybody is to make money and like make a living doing this, right? But what you'll notice is as soon as you sell that first script or whatever that is, whatever that accomplishment is, your, your ego immediately, you want the next one or the next, or now yeah. I got to do this. So it's not about the, the finishing, you know, crossing the finish line. It's about the path to getting there, looking back and being like, man, that took me that took me a lot of rewrites. That took me many years <laughs> to get that agent or manager or whatever it is. But, um, but it's all, all I am to Jaron and to my clients and to everybody, all I am is, is uh, gasoline in the engine of their vehicle. And that's Ooh, it. I like that. That's literally it, you know? And I hope to have a, a, a lot of gasoline to be able to keep pouring into that tank for you guys so we can get as far down to the road to that destination as you want to get, you know? I like that. Well, thank you very much. Good yeah. stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, everybody, make sure you go to uh, the ISA events page. We have a bunch more coming up the rest of this month, including a lot of um, events about pitching. So <laughs> awesome. go there. Huge look everything up. Very important yeah. tool. Next yeah. Wednesday, a pitch class. Then we have the next week after that, we're doing a whole you know, pitch panel about pitching and so start getting your pitches ready we're going to get all of that going can't wait for week. that we're getting comments that they'd love another q a with you too matt so uh, <laughs> maybe down very, the line very kind of you guys yeah, yeah that'd be fun to do I'd, I'd be happy to do it again